it's got to say about that. Because he doesn't view it that way. We had a man in, in Chicago who was a homosexual of many years standing. We ministered to him and he was delivered. He's leading a victorious, normal life today. But he told somebody that was involved in the situation, he said, I didn't get deliverance till I acknowledged that it was a demon and I wanted to be free of it. Homosexuals are not harder to deliver than other people. What's harder is to convince them that they need deliverance. Number five, where are we? Addictions. I enjoy this because I don't have to hurry through it all in one lesson. I don't know whether you do or not, but to me it's a relief. Because usually I've got to give this all in one hour and twenty minutes, and you really can't do it thoroughly. Now, there are many... An addiction is a perverted appetite. That's basically what it is. I think all appetites basically are placed there by God for our good, but Satan causes us to pervert them, misdirect them, and then we become enslaved by them. Now, there are many common forms of addiction, but you know Brother Prince well enough. The first one he always puts up is gluttony. And that's the commonest in America, in my opinion. You see, it's a respectable addiction. Most churches, it's not respectable to be an alcoholic. But it's quite respectable to be a foodaholic. Now, that whether you become a foodaholic or an alcoholic depends only on your social situation. See? I've given this example many times. The Episcopalian lady, whose husband is running around with another woman and spending much more money than he earns, gets mad, frustrated, bitter, angry, and has to have a release, where does she go? The martini, the cocktail, the gin bottle, and so on. That's natural for an Episcopalian. And I mean, that's not a criticism. But now take the Church of God, for whom alcohol is an abomination. Her husband starts doing exactly the same. She can't, I mean, the gin bottle isn't within sight of her. But the cookie jar is right on the shelf. See? But where does she go? Just there. And it's just as serious an addiction to be addicted to food as it is to alcohol. And probably kills as many people. Directly or indirectly. I had in Chicago dealings with a married woman who was the daughter of a Church of God pastor. Church of God Pentecostal. And she had been brought up in this narrow, legalistic form of religion, thou shalt not, don't touch, don't eat, don't smoke, don't dance, don't go with boys who do, and all that. And uh, she, like most young people brought up in that, rebelled against it. You want to make a real first-class rebel, bring them up with negative religion, you, you succeed. So she ran away from God and got married and had three children and then came to Chicago for deliverance. And she knew what she was coming for. She came from Indiana, long journey at night. And she got it. And it was very manifest that she was getting delivered. And she said to me two things afterwards. And you know, of course, the Church of God basically would say that a Christian can't have a demon. She said, Brother Prince, don't let anybody tell you this isn't real. She said, it's as real as having a baby and rather like it. And I've had three. I know what it's like. And she told me, she said, you know that my condition was so bad that I would even steal the food off my children's plate, though I knew they needed it. Now, it's not only ladies. Last summer, if I remember rightly, we had at this camp a minister, and I will not state about denomination, a man in his 50s or 60s. And in, uh, some of you ladies sitting in the back, I can see the very lady that dealt with him. And he had a very powerful, dramatic, manifest deliverance. And I, all the time I thought I ought to get over to the poor man, and I couldn't do it. Just every time I tried to get there, I couldn't. So I asked this lady, what was he being delivered from? She said, gluttony. And he told her afterwards, he said, you know, this thing had such a grip on me that it was absolutely misdirecting the course of my life and spoiling my marriage. He said, I would go downtown, buy two dollars worth of candy, eat it all in the car on the way home, and then lie to my wife about where I'd be. I was in Birmingham, Alabama last year. I was there again this year. Anybody was in Birmingham this time? Yeah. Well, I was in the same hotel before, and we had about the first deliverance that they've ever had in that hotel. <laughs> and it became quite exciting. And I don't want to go into the 
<laughs> I don't want to go into the, you know, gory details, but it was comical. I, fortunately, I have somewhere behind me a sense of humor, because there was a very plump-looking woman, and she threw up. I mean, she threw up. <laughs> I said, sister, that was gluttony, wasn't it? She said, yes, it was. And I said, the one that went before was resentment. She said, it was. I said, well, praise the Lord. You see, let me point this out about addictions. An addiction is a branch on a trunk. In my opinion, addiction never is the beginning. There's always some frustration out of which the addiction emerges. You see, the frustrated Episcopalian wife takes to alcohol. But what's the drover to alcohol? The misbehavior of her husband. The frustrated Church of God wife takes to the cookie jar and the pastry tray. What drove her there? The ice cream, don't forget that. What drove her there? Same thing. So when you deal with an addiction, you can do this. You can cut the branch off, but you still leave the trunk standing. See? Whereas if you cut the trunk down, the branch has to go. In other words, find out what's behind the addiction. Sometimes it's resentment, sometimes it's rebellion, sometimes it's fear. There are many different causes. Shame, guilt, so on. Let's just write up a few more addictions while we're about it. Not that I'm going to make a long list. There's gluttony, alcohol, nicotine. Pep tablets, sleeping pills, caffeine, heroin, airplane glue, nail varnish, and scores of other strange things. The devil doesn't care how strange or improbable the thing is that he hooks you with. As long as he hooks you, that's all he's concerned. Any hook that will catch you is good enough for the devil. Now, I hope you're not thinking I'm preaching do-nots. But my experience with nicotine is that it's often more powerful than heroin. And I've heard David Wilkerson, not directly, but secondhand, say that he will not minister to an addict for deliverance, that that addict will not give up smoking. And I agree. Because nicotine is a, is, a, is a kind of fifth column. It stays there and opens the door for the others to come back again. And I have met not a few addicts, I know them personally, who said it was more difficult to be delivered from nicotine than heroin. And of course there's all sorts of other fancy things, like marijuana and so on, which we're not going to go into in detail. Now we've got about two minutes left, not by that clock, but by my internal clock. Uh, no, we haven't. What's today? Sunday? How many more days have we got? Monday? Tuesday? Monday, Tuesday. No, not Wednesday. No, Monday, Tuesday. Monday, Tuesday. Hmm? Two days. Well, then we haven't got enough time. Do you... Um, no, I can't do that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's enthusiasm, anyhow. Uh, I'll go and keep going for another five or ten minutes, all right? I really seem to be dawdling on the way, but you don't know what a relief it is not to be under pressure from a clock, or not too much pressure. I am also going into this in some detail because I'm under the impression that quite a number of you are already familiar with this and are ministering to others. Is that right? And therefore, I'm trying to give you some of the tricks of the trade. Shall I give you one very useful trick of the trade? Now, you, you may think I'm awful, but I have never found this wrong. If a person, when they get delivered, their fingers go stiff and begin to bend backward, and if particularly also they get kind of cold or numb around the mouth, it's masturbation. I've never found it otherwise. And it just solves a lot of problems. You can tell that poor embarrassed person, I know what your problem is, just renounce it, it will go. That's one of the little, you can call it tricks of the train. Now then, let's take the field of religion. We can't do it. Well, let's take heresies. What number was that? Six. Six. Heresies. Now then, 
departures from the Christian faith. We'll deal with the occult, though I know Brother Hobart Freeman is doing it. The thing is, those of you that have been here haven't been there, so we may have to deal with the occult here as well. Not because I suggest there's any lack of completeness in his dealing with it. I'm sure it's much more complete. But let's take heresies and we'll depart. Now, heresies are departures from the Christian faith. That this is going to happen, let's just look at one scripture, 1 Timothy 4, 1. You know the medical name for what I was describing in connection with masturbation is tetany. And I had a very strange experience a little while ago in a city in Florida where we were in a deliverance service and a young man was manifesting all these symptoms. So I went over to him, but there was a very nice, well-dressed and sort of, you know, authoritative-looking man there. And he was saying, now, stop breathing out. Stop, hold your breath. And I stood and listened to him for a little while. And I, then I said quietly, I said, I'm sorry, but I have to disagree with you. It's no good holding your breath while the demon is inside. Get the demon out and then hold your breath. And he deferred to me and said, go on, brother, you do it. So I did. And then afterwards he told me he was a medical doctor that this was a, the whole series of symptoms put together was known as tetany, and that the medical remedy was to hold your breath, because excessive breathing out will produce this uh, set of symptoms. So we had a real good talk together. But he saw the difference in the young man when the demon left him. And he wrote me a very nice letter of one page explaining how grateful he was that he realized that there was something missing in his ability to minister to these people. I just mentioned that. Now, First Timothy 4, 1. Are you with me? Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. It's the demons who speak lies. It's the demons who have their consciences seared with a hot iron. I can't take time to show it to you, but the Greek makes that absolutely clear. So in the latter times, some are going to depart from the faith. What is the faith? Christianity. So these people have known Christianity, are going to depart from it. You cannot depart from this building if you've never been in it, can you? And why are they going to depart? They're going to do it under the influence of demons, seducing spirits. And there are many, many, many seducing spirits. Religious spirits, spirits of error, spirits that entice you away from faith in Jesus Christ according to the Scriptures. I'll tell you a little incident. It wasn't little. It lasted five hours. But we had a woman in Chicago, who's a friend of ours now, we know her personally, who was delivered from, one lady sat there and counted, wrote the names down, she counted 72 different spirits that came out. I mean, this is her count, not mine. But in the middle of this, these spirits are all speaking out of this woman. In the middle, one said, I'm a seducing spirit. Well, I said, come out in the name of Jesus. It said, I'm the seducer of the faith. Well, I said, still come out in the name of Jesus. Then it said, I'm the chief one. Well, I said, still come out. And then it said, I have many roots. So I said, come out with all your roots in the name of Jesus. And then 